Tashi, you can record. Okay, I hit record. Does that mean it's recording? Yes, it's recording. Okay, wonderful. All right. So um, we're going to start on the count of three. Everyone, please keep yourselves muted to um, speak. Unmute yourself to speak, but then mute yourself immediately after that. So that'll just stop the feedback. And um, I think we've covered everything. So let's begin on the count of three. One, two, three. Hi, um, I'm Tashi Powers, and today I'm going to talk to you. It's kind of part two, but it's our workbook work on the Venus pentagram, and this is the ascent year where she's an evening star. And I'm um, looking forward to lots of our volunteers, and we'll have a little bit of a talk about the overall subject. If any of you are brand new to this subject, there are lots of um, wonderful videos already on Zoom. Linda started it. And then I've done some, and I think others have as well. So you can look for those if you need more background information. This might be a little bit advanced. Okay, and so here we go. Um, this year, Venus will be an evening star. In my studies of this, I realized that one year she's a morning star, and one year she's an evening star. So in 2018, her first gate begins in March, and we're going to go through the seven gates. I'm looking at people's charts and we wanted to talk about the fact that Venus in the old myths she disappears into sunlight and in the old myths she disappears into the realm of her sister Urshkagal. In the Sumerian myth she's in the realm of her sister Urshkagal and then she comes back out of that and that was considered the ascent phase. But what's really really happening with computers is we now realize Venus is not at all underground. She's actually in light. She's lost in the solar glare in this last several weeks. It happens in the evening star phase and it happens in the morning star phase. So Venus rises as an evening star and a few weeks after the Sun and Venus meet in the superior conjunction. That will happen this year in October, all right? The, so this long seven gate thing begins before the superior conjunction. That's how it works with the superior conjunction and the evening star. The Venus-Earth superior conjunction occurs when Venus is behind the sun. She is closest to the sun and furthest from the Earth in the evening star phase. The Venus-Earth superior conjunction um, will form at the superior conjunction when Venus is direct and moving near its maximum speed. So I've called this in my earlier lectures the Kumari Kiss because 10,000 years ago in Vedic culture, they believe that the Kumaris were this ancient race of beings that whenever Venus and the sun formed at either the inferior or the superior conjunction, they gave humanity a kiss. And there are very long cycles of Venus and the sun making these gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful images that, that we have in our earlier um, seminars here. So the full phase is the evening star phase, and that's why it's considered to be more social. Uh, we're compelled to complete our social tasks and work on how we relate more objectively to the world and others, and especially if we look as good as this beautiful beauty here. <laughs> Here's a picture of um, the fivefold pentagrams of Venus in nature, all right? So a little bit more about the evening star. Let's see. I, I put in some links from the sky.org. They have really good information for all of you to look up all of the technical stuff for January 8th, 2018, as well as what's coming in October. And as I go through different people's examples, um, you're going to see that you're going to want to go and look at the in, in the sky. Uh, .org links that are on this um, third slide. All right, so hopefully you can see those okay. And if are they too small? If somebody wants, maybe um, somebody wants to tell me, Wanda, should I read them out or can people be able to no. get those? No, Tash, you don't read them out. They're... Okay, all right, good. So um, there we go. 
Now, Venus begins her ascent after she forms a new pentagram point and appears as an evening star, all right? So she began her pentagram point at the inferior conjunction in January of 2018, where she created a new pentagram point. And then she doesn't appear right away as an evening star. Um, Venus, Venus had her heliacal rise in the west where she became an evening star in february and i actually at first thought that was the first gate but it isn't it takes another month and she is now going to on march 18th as you probably know she's going to ascend back up through the seven gates where she is restored to her position as the queen of heaven and i am relating that in my new book which is on all of these links here as um, more the monomyth, more Joseph Campbell. She's the master of two worlds. Um, I'm a little, I, I studied with Joseph Campbell, so I love myth, but I really want to bring it more modern. So I'm going to use modern myths. And the first gate is Aries, observe your separating desires. So all of us in evolutionary astrology know that our separating desires are the ones that our soul has come here to figure out. And they are shown to us by our Mars and mostly by our Mars-Pluto relationship, which is something as an evolutionary astrologer, you really have to learn and you have to be familiar with. This first one in Aries is, and when we go through examples, I've connected everybody's Mars um, as you need to do when you're studying. You can't just study one thing. You can't just say, oh, it's an Aries-Venus-Moon conjunction, which is what this is. The first gate is the moon and Venus at 14 Aries 48. But you'll have to do what you do with all astrology is synthesize absolutely everything. So of course the Aries Libra is the balance of the Aries need for freedom to express itself and consideration for others. And we will want as this Aries um, first gate happens to really have freedom to express ourselves. So it's always very important, especially with Venus and Aries, to remember to be considerate of others. So the seven gates at each of the Venus evening star gates, we integrate values and insights into our emotional body correlating to the Venus moon conjunctions. And that's just basic evolutionary astrology, values and insights into our emotional body, all right? That's Venus and the moon. The evening star seven gates correlate to the balsamic phase. Now that is all astronomical, and I'm not going to get into that too much today. Evening star periods are social in nature, as we've said again, and this is a more deliberate goal-oriented period. So this first of the seven gates, we're going to feel deliberate, which is already an Aries feeling. So there's this very strong intention. And I think you'll be able to see this with the examples. The events and experience of the past year's descent, 2017's descent in the morning star phase, has given us a wider perspective as we choose the path forward. The ascent of the seven Venus moon conjunctions, as I've just said, correlates eventually to the reward and return with the elixir in Joseph Campbell's monomyth. And I, I'm not going to plug my book, but this is the only thing I have to say to you. That's all. I've correlated everything with evolutionary astrology and Joseph Campbell's monomyth. And it's not in the rest of this talk. I'm sorry. During the evening star ascent direct, okay, because there's part of evening star retrograde, we are likely to be extroverted as we're building strengths and strength and relationships throughout the seven new moon, new Venus moon conjunctions. So what I feel is, since we're going towards this queen of heaven feeling or this return and reward with the elixir, those who are successful in finding their authentic voice are often influencers if that is, if, if that is within their soul's purpose. I think that's the queen of heaven, seventh gate business, all right? So here's the actual chart of gate one. Being um, astrologers, of course, we have to study this chart. So I want you to see that she is an evening star. So here's Venus. For those of you who are, you know, newer to astrology, there's Venus and there's the moon and there's the sun. Now the sun, this is the descendant. So this is sunset and the sun is going to move over this first and then we'll, Venus will move down and the moon will move down. Everything is moving this way. Okay, that's, this is, 
sunset. This is midnight down here at 10 Sag. Over here, the ascendant for this chart, ascendant is east, and that's sunrise. And then up here at the top is noon, high noon, all right? And we call that the midheaven in astrology. So there's Venus moving after the sun over the descendant. So she, that's how you can see visibly that she's an evening star, for those of you who might need to see that. Now let me just erase this if I can. Goodness me, select eraser. Give me a second to erase all that. Okay. Um, so now, so here we have um, the moon Venus conjunction at 1448. Now I always do the chart for the country. So if you live in a different country, you might want to just pick the moon Venus conjunction and figure out what house it's in. But for the American Collective, for Washington, D.C., this is Sunday at 5.58 p.m. And the Moon-Venus conjunction is in our eighth house of in evolutionary astrology. That's the house of self-empowerment. It's Pluto's house, and it's the house of our soul work, aligning ourselves with our soul's purpose. Let's see. The planets are moving clockwise, Melanie. The planets do move through the horoscope, through the day, uh, this way, counterclockwise. Then they move through the signs clockwise. All right, Melanie, that's just basic astrology. But I'm glad you asked because we could have lost a lot of people with that. So you never know. It's, fi it's fine to ask me questions. I'll keep my... I'll keep my um, chat open all right uh let's see but i do lose my spot <laughs> so okay so there's the moon and venus um now in all astrology we would look to see who is dispositing this aries where is mars and here's mars interestingly enough in capricorn and for those of us who are evolutionary astrologers the fact that pluto is in capricorn on its own nodes is a very very big deal and Mars is now balsamic to that's Lilith, Saturn, and Pluto. And Mars is also at a very important point, zero, zero Capricorn is true south. It's the winter solstice. It's one of those very pivotal points, all right? And the sun stops moving south and starts moving north at zero, zero Capricorn. So there's a pretty powerful Mars. And the aspect between Mars and the moon Venus is a biceptile. So a biceptile in EA is considered an aspect of fate. It's at 102.5, all right? And it's one of those pathfinder uh, aspects where you have to set your intention very clearly. And um, EA and Jeffrey teach that you go back and you look at the conjunction. So we're not going to do that to look at what the intention is of the planets. Um, because that's too complicated for today. But this biceptile means that Mars in the fourth, which is emotional self um, sustenance, and the moon, which again is the ruler of the fourth house, in this biceptile and Venus are having to go forward with very clear intention. This is one of the key words for this biceptile in EA. All right? Very clear intention. And so the fourth house, eighth house is this deep, soulful, emotional, the emotional body of the moon, knowing that you're connected to the divine, that you're going to get there because you're connected yourself. And it's Capricorn can be very codependent and Saturn rules the first stage of codependence in evolutionary astrology. But this biceptile says work with this codependence, make good choices, look at your basic intention find your path, go forward by being very clear that you're going forward in a way where, and we'll see this moon Venus in Aries with Mercury Uranus, where you are awakening, where you are aligning your willpower, which is more the whole, that's more our sun, but the whole kind of stellium in the eighth house with God's will and Uranus with this sense of being connected to your tribe, to your community, learning. Studying astrology, for those of us who are here, is excellent for this septile. And then learning with Capricorn, 
to be very aware of what is your work in the world. And I'm going to jump to this quote on number nine over and over again, because I just love Jeffrey's quote that I found in the workbook. Capricorn re represents how you're going to establish your sense of personal authority, Leo, in the context of the society you live in. The need to establish personal authority is basic. When done rightly, you will receive, oh, you receive recognition for it, okay? So I'm going to come back to that over and over again because I think it's just the most succinct, beautiful thing to explain this Capricorn energy that this Mars Moon Venus Septile is directing us towards really growing up. Capricorn is maturity when it isn't codependence, it's maturity and it's finding what is the reason for my life? What is my life's work? Okay, so Pluto on its nodes, I've written here government, sure, there, I mean, maybe South Korea and North Korea are going to get together, hopefully. There's lots of laws and rules and conformity with Saturn Pluto. Um, but it's also this desire to be responsible and to do your life's work and to realize there's only so much time to do your life's work and so to get on with it. And I think this biceptile here, which is in the um, full phase, it's just after the 90 degrees. So from 90 to 135, you can see is the first quarter phase, crisis in action, is actually deciding for yourself well, what should I do? What's the most responsible thing for me to do to use my time effectively? So I think that's what this gate one in this chart really speaks to us. And there we have Pluto, which is always the first thing we go to in EA. And we see Pluto at 20. And the only other thing in the 20s, early and close to Pluto, is beautiful Jupiter in Scorpio retrograde in a closing sextile which is that light worker sextile to Pluto. So that should help us really be learning, using this energy of this septile to study and for some people to teach um, and to write. And certainly that's been happening um, in my world. And then the sun is conjunct Chiron. And so I, I noticed when I saw that, I love Chiron, the wounded healer. And you like Chiron better, just so you know, when you get past 51 and you've had your Chiron return, when you survive that. <laughs> um, I'm joking, happy Chiron. Because you really begin to look at the shadow and you, start, you stop really blaming and you start growing up. And all of this is, is speaking to that. This Pisces sun is gonna be very influential in this chart. Neptune is right on the descendant, so dreaming, Juno, how we're aligning with others, are we self-empowered? There's a very beautiful quote on Jeffrey's message board um, from Demetra George, and she says, Juno is either self-empowerment or betrayal. And when I read that, it really explained to me the essence of Juno, self-empowerment or betrayal. And so for all of us with Neptune conjunct Juno, we're going to have to watch for that and we're going to have to heal ourselves very carefully with the Chiron, Sun, Neptune, Juno conjunction. What's real and what is the bull? What is going on? Where's the fox in the hen house? Look carefully at things, all right? That will be part of this gate one as well. All right, and then I wrote a little bit more about gate one. So... What I discovered about the evening star is that it relates to the full phase balsamic phase, all right? So we start with it, and um, this is an excerpt here from Joseph Campbell's monomyth. We start this with a sense of, and I know this is a moon-venus conjunction, but as everybody knows who knows astrology, things are very layered, all right? So Venus is in her opposition phase with the sun. And so I'm tying that in to, this is um, the Joseph Campbell meeting with the goddess, integration of self and society progresses, all right? And so that's what's going on at this first gate. And then I like, of course, the tarot very much, being that she is the mother, probably one of the mothers of astrology. 
And this is my friend's beautiful Venus card, Lee McCloskey. The Empress is the third key in the Terra Arcana and is represented astrologically by the planet Venus. The Empress symbolizes mother, nature, the fullness of fertility, growth, prosperity, peace, and beauty. She is creative inspiration and the guardian of true magic. To her belong love, beauty, art, imagination, intuition, sensuality, and desire. She symbolizes love as the formative energy of the universe. She is a sustaining and nurturing mother of all creation. Luminous intelligence is the mode of consciousness attributed to the Empress. She is known as the mother of light, the mother of ideas, described as pure emotion, having no subject or object, being filled with an emanating light. She is the passageway between luminous light and the unknowable supreme darkness, which I just thought was the most wonderful quote, considering we are looking at the ascent of Venus from sunlight. She is light. She is this luminous intelligence. So really use these keywords to think about what you're dealing with, all right, in our work today. And then I read this, and I'm going to read it again, because I think this quote from Jeffrey is the most, I have a lot of Capricorn, so this has really helped me. But we have our current uh, Venus pentagram point in Capricorn, so this is why I put this in here. Capricorn in the tarot is the world card. Capricorn re represents how you're going to establish your sense of personal authority, Leo, in the context of the society you live in. The need to establish personal authority is basic. When done rightly, you receive recognition from it, for it. And so this is the world card, and you can see this beautiful figure reaching down and the other figure pulling up. Um, this is from Lee McCloskey. And then he says, the world is the 21st key in the tarot arcana and represented astrologically by the planet Saturn. And as we all know, Saturn is associated with time, maturity, structure, gravitation, boundaries, the truth about the truth, and beauty through perfection. The mode of consciousness attributed to the world archetype is administrative, intelligence, suggesting that it guides and directs the energies of manifestation, formalizing patterns that govern life and order creation. All right, and so this is a beautiful, beautiful image that my friend was kind enough to let me use and is always kind enough. So we have our current VP point at 18 Capricorn and it formed on January 8th, 9th, depending on where you live, 2018. And it was conjunct the North Node of Pluto. So I do hope that the events connected to that in the world will be easy to understand as time passes. Um, Jeffrey spoke at length in various videos, which can be found on YouTube, about the tumultuous period of Pluto's transit through Capricorn. Pluto is also transiting its own North Node 2018 and 19, and it is my hope the Kumari kiss will cause a huge reform. And as of this writing, the Olympic Games in Korea may bring a resolution between North and South Korea, which of course would be pointed out by this historic transit of the VPP conjunct Pluto and the nodes of Pluto. Possibly. The following VPP will be in Scorpio in October, and that Scorpio VPP is fading. The last Scorpio VPP occurs on October 2026, but the next VPP begins in that series in Libra in 2022, which is also when Pluto goes into Aquarius. So 2022 is gonna be really interesting. Um, a changing VPP is huge, and I've spoken about that before in earlier videos, and um, I'm certainly writing about it. All right. Here are the dates of the Capricorn star that forms, the pentagram Capricorn. Uh, I'm, I'm calling it a Venus pentagram point. The Venus pentagram point closest to your birth, month, and day is your natal um, Venus pentagram point. And you place that in your chart. And we have lots of examples coming on how to do that. And the house where all five are located will show you how everything is working. So you'll have inferior conjunctions when it's retrograde and superior conjunctions when it's direct. All five points 
are attractors. Venus is an attractor, okay? They line up with important events and charts of those individuals with whom you share the journey of life. So Venus causes us to learn how to be self-sufficient in evolutionary astrology. She rules the second house and she rules the seventh house. And so in the seventh house, she's very attractive and magnetic. And in the second house, we are really internalizing Venus and learning about our own self-worth. Venus's pentagram current point in Capricorn correlates to your intention to be responsible. Its position can indicate the arena where you must take a leadership role or you must just simply mature depending on where you're at. Not everybody needs to be a leader. So you can see, sorry, that it began in 1986 at 29 Capricorn. And 1986 also began a Leo pentagram point. So people born in that year, and I happen to know a lot of them because I have a child born right around this time, are really intensely responsible workaholics um, to begin with, and we'll see as they mature. So now you can see how it's moved from 86 to 2018 in 30 some years um, to 18. Okay, we're in the middle now. We've entered the second decan of this. Um, just this year, we've entered the next decan of this. And so it's going to stay at 18 for the next couple of years. And you can see how it moves kind of slowly. It, it grabs a degree and then it jumps and it jumps and it skips. You know, it's going to skip 17. It's going to skip 15 and 14. You see that? So here we are at 18 Capricorn coinciding with Pluto being on its moons, uh, being on its nodes, having our lovely um, Pluto Capricorn period of learning how to work well in the world, how the world works on us, what is the world, what are we doing in the world, and some people are having huge crises because they don't know that. And I think, you know, you have to, as an evolutionary astrologer, with Pluto, it's always important to become self-empowered, and it's always important when you do become self-empowered to help others empower, to teach, to share. Sharing, caring, and inclusion are the key words of Pluto in evolutionary astrology. I should say of evolutionary astrology's evolutionary momentum, all right? So let's see, it's 516 and I am now ready to do, oh, and by the way, thank you so much to Linda for making this beautiful presentation for me. She knows I've been insanely busy, so I'm just so grateful, it's so beautiful, Linda. And um, collaboration is very evolutionary astrology <laughs> friendly. So thank you. Um, sh let's see, how many minutes has that been? 45? Uh, no, 30 minutes. So. Okay. Well, let's, uh, if, if anybody has questions now about the overview, yeah. I'm very happy to answer some questions about the yeah, overview. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to ask me about, let's see, the chart? Um, any of the points about ascension, Venus ascension, evening star, it's a pretty heady subject, okay? So if everybody's mentally kind of like checking out, I get it. It's, hey, Ta Tashi, it's Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Tashi. Um, there's the slide that you were talking about. I think it might be the next one or the one you were talking about a uh, sun Venus conjunction. Um, that like, yes. Ah, okay. The opposition. Venus, yeah, like, yeah. Okay. okay. So that, that goes back up to here. That goes here. So, um, at, at in the sky.org, it says about the superior, conjunction that Venus um, is in between no Venus is on the other side of the Sun the farthest away from us that she can be uh, let me read it to you Venus will pass very close to the Sun in the sky as its orbit carries it around the far side of the solar system from the earth this occurs once in every synodic cycle of the planet, which is 584 days, and marks the end of Venus's 
Apparition means appearance in the morning sky and its transition to becoming an evening object over the next few weeks. At closest approach, Venus will appear at a separation of only 46 minutes from the sun, making it totally unobservable for several weeks while it is lost in the sun's glare. Does that answer you? No, I don't understand. If you go back to the other slide. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's an astronomical thing. It's not a Venus Sun opposition. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. What? Right. <laughs> it doesn't I look know. that way in the chart. And Wendy, I, I see it in your example that you're going to start to teach this, and I'm so excited. I hope women all over the world will teach other women. I hope. We yeah. I really feel like it's time, and anything I can do to help anybody who wants to teach this and learn this, just email me. I will. I, I mean, I, I'm that way anyway of a Venus Jupiter conjunction, but I've learned through studying evolutionary astrology that inclusion, sharing, and caring is how we evolve, all right? So I want us all, especially, we do not know, you guys, very much about this subject yet. It's deep and profound. And I think that we've been looking at it, you know, really only probably since 2004, when everybody got turned on by the transit of Venus. And, okay, I'm trying to find the chat. And I... um. <laughs> was it planned to have this meeting on International Women's Day? No, it wasn't. We're not, I'm not that smart, but it's also a Mercury entering the um, shadow day too, isn't it? I think it is today. I made a note of that. I don't have it in front of me, but I did. Yes, congratulations to women on Women's International Day. Yeah, and so something that I've discovered that I'm writing about is that the last time Venus transited the sun is when Galileo figured out that Venus was not orbiting the earth, all right? So that is huge, everybody. And now, yeah, isn't that crazy? Okay. What? Yes. It doesn't make any sense. In the 1600s, there was a Venus transit of the sun. Oh, okay. Uh I'm thinking Venus like conjuncting the sun, but I know what you're talking about. The yeah. transit of, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. called the transit of Venus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's when he figured it out. And now we're figuring out all of this. So that's why I'm so excited, right? Anyone else? Tashi, it might be a good idea here to um, explain morning star and evening star in a chart rather than sure. the technical stuff, yeah. Okay, so, well, I did explain that this was an evening star, right? Now, if Venus was yes. setting first, she'd be a morning star because she'd be rising before, but when she sets after the sun, she's an evening star. Because when this sun is now below the ascendant, Venus is still visible. This day, when Venus sets, March 18th, you'll probably be able to see her close to the moon. Mm. And you'll probably be able to see Mercury, too. But if Venus was a morning star, she would be down here where Neptune is, and she would be coming up as this is going around. Let me get a, another um, tool here. She would be coming, they come around. Oh, that's not it. Let's see. Okay, oh, I see spotlight. Got it. So the planets move this way around the chart. So if Venus was Neptune, she would be coming up before the sun. But you see, she will come up after the sun. So you won't be able to see her because the sun is too bright for us to see Venus. But So you can see her in the evening, and that's why she's called an evening star. You wouldn't be able to see her in the morning. The only thing I could do is I could jump out of this and go to my solar fire and show everybody. But I can, when we go through the charts, we can look at people. But does everybody understand the morning star, what it really 
that this is an evening star because she's visible at night. The sun's about to set over the descendant. And when the sun comes up in the morning, Venus will be down here behind the sun and you won't be able to see her. You have kind of have to know that everything's moving. All right. Oops. <laughs> so Tashi, um, I have a question. Sure. So this evening star, which begins on in, Mar in March, right? Uh, she began in February. Oh, February. Sorry. Yes. Yes. And so there's seven gates and the gates go for up to September, right? Right. Right. And then we have the next VPP in Scorpio. Right. In October. Right. And that's, that is then still not an evening star, right? That becomes a morning star. It will turn into the morning star. Yes. Yes. It's and in then, my book. I can't remember all the dates right now. Okay. <laughs> and then there will be seven gates for the morning star, right? 2000. It starts at the end of 2018, and then it goes through 2019. Uh-huh. So there's, in total, 14 gates. There's in... seven morning star gates and seven um, evening star gates. And those are, right. we've been knowing about those probably since this ancient Sumerian myth. They correlated them to the chakras, and I haven't found that myself helpful. Uh, it's too confusing for me. I just don't find it helpful, but I think, Wendy, if you know how to do that, great. And if anyone else does, great. I've correlated it to Joseph Campbell's monomyth. Um, because I worked in the film industry for a long time and I studied with Joseph Campbell, I know that myth very well, and it's, his monomyth is the myth of all the myths, and what we're really doing, kind of like evolutionary astrology. And so this is the beginning of the second half of the phase in evolutionary astrology where we're in the full phase. The evening star is the full phase. And so the first gate is the opposition. I'm correlating it, you know. I mean, other people may have other ideas. It's, this is, I'm very... Um, I have Uranus on the Ascendant on the South Node, so I feel like I can figure things out. <laughs> okay, Hopefully I have it right. Tashi. Yeah. So what does that mean in opposition of 180? You're correlating the first, you're, you're correlating the balsamic phase and the different gates to these. I'm correlating the full phase through the balsamic phase. Okay, I see, I see, okay. And those are the five and, phases. Yeah. And Wendy, since you're going to teach this, you're going to be able to buy the book in a few days for $3.99. Everybody can. I'm, I'm, yeah. I really I'm, want to disseminate information. Well, I'm going to be teaching it in a, from a different... Yeah, from a different point of view, which is great. But the more we know, the more we can help everyone, you know? Oh, knowledge, yeah, absolutely. Knowledge is so self-empowering in, in my version of things. Of course, as a Gemini, we have to learn we can't know everything. <laughs> anyway, um, so did I answer the questions? Yes. And these are the keywords that I'm using for these aspects that are a combination of, you know, the Rudyard, Jeffries, and the monomyth. And the seven gates will deal with, the first couple of gates will deal with these energies. Tashi, it's Jennifer. Hi. Um, I've been scribbling madly. I'm just wondering if you're going to let us have access to the slides. If you want to, sure. It would be great. It helps me, um, writing down helps me remember, but I'm missing big chunks too. <laughs> okay, well, if you want me to stop on any slide, you know what I do sometimes? Just get out your cell phone and take a picture. All okay. of this, I've written a book. It's going to be okay. very inexpensive. And on March 18th, it's going to be available to everybody. And before then, it'll be available to you guys. So it's... Thank it's you. Up. And everything's in there and more, much more than this. I just felt almost like it channeled itself through me. I love it. And I can't wait to get the book. It's a lot to take in. So I'm trying not to stress on memorizing it as we go. Just trying to absorb as much as I can. 
Yeah. And, and a lot of people have done research. There's a lot of information on the internet. You know, there's really quite a lot. And I'm so proud of Wendy that she wants to help teach this. I don't have time right now myself. I'm going to teach it like I do once a month in LA. That's it. I, I really am so busy with other things so that I'm like, I just feel like jump on the springboard and go. And it's just so extremely exciting that we have the opportunity with computers to know what happened last year at the gates and what happens next year. And you're going to see many of these gates repeat and some signs aren't even part of the gates. You know, there's a lot. So it's a little too much to teach, but um, there's not much, there's only one Sagittarius and one Virgo gate in 17, 18, 19 and 20. Isn't that interesting? The moon Venus. So I think, for me, what I'm seeing is that Venus has this very powerful teaching energy uh, of the bigger things, like giving humanity electricity, then telephones, now the internet. Though, and then for Galileo to discover that Venus was going around the sun on the last transit of Venus, and on this transit of Venus, for us to be understanding that we can actually work with this. We can get enough astronomical understanding and astrological understanding because I've just been obsessed with wanting to know more about Venus and the sun because the Mayans were studying that and they seem to have gotten it wrong. We didn't all die in 2012, which was the next transit of Venus. You know, it really got my attention how many people had been studying it. And seemingly, I don't know if they misunderstood it, if the Mayans were translated incorrectly but they didn't have computers. You know, well, what do we know what they had? They might have had spaceships and better computers, but it's just been very fascinating to me. But did they really think we were going to die? It was just the end of one time and the beginning of another. Well, I heard derivative Mayan prophecies. Certainly, I didn't hear it directly from them. And I did hear that, <laughs> but it wasn't from a Mayan. <laughs> and Tashi, I realized why I couldn't comprehend what you were saying about the phases because I learned the chakras as the gates. So I'm thinking seven gates and I'm seeing five phases and I'm thinking, what? Like I, I couldn't, my mind couldn't like grasp that. Oh, now I get it. That's so you're, just a, you're spreading those phases over those seven. Gates. Yeah. yeah. And the other part is also in there. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of people on here who are not quite as conversant with evolutionary astrology. Some have more understanding. And, and so there's, it's just a lot to teach. When we go through these examples, we'll be able to speak about things a little better, I guess. So I, I can't think of um, anything else to tell you. Morning star, evening star. Yeah, morning star is the inferior conjunction and it's the descent and that's good to memorize that, okay? Write that down. Morning star, descent, inferior conjunction. And there's a lot of very good links. Um, there's an ephemeris that astro.com gives to everybody that explains everything. So you can study all of this yourself. You can be very self-empowered and learn it yourself. Okay, so I have one more comment question. So when Linda's question about the seven gates, so this year we're in the evening star phase, seven gates. So in October, that's when Venus goes retrograde after she finishes that last gate. Yeah, the evening star ends with a retrograde conjunction and the inferior conjunction is the retrograde. And the morning star happens fairly quickly after that. That's correct. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out. So every time it cycles through, that's when Venus goes retrograde. After the evening star. Yeah. Yeah. After the evening star. Yep. Yeah. The technological understanding of all this takes a while. And the symbolic understanding of it. You know, I learned a lot of symbolic understanding before I learned technical understanding. And I'm trying very hard to understand all the technical now. Um, 
it's some people never bother to learn both and i'm with you that's how i've learned <laughs> well yeah yeah i i you know very neptunian and also i mean you know we we grew up in a culture where they just didn't teach women the same way they taught men so all these men who knew all this stuff would be like well i'm not going to tell you your little you know and of course i didn't fall for that i went and bought a book and read it <laughs> on my own i couldn't learn it Tashi, how about we have a break now and come back with the volunteer charts? Okie dokie. Five, ten minutes? What, what would you like? Five, ten, fifteen? Oh, I'm, I'm good with five minutes. I'm just going to have a sip. Okay. We'll see you back we, I'm, I'm sure people are very interested to learn about their charts. So fi how about five minutes? Sure. Okay, okay, guys, see you back here in five minutes. Don't okay. leave the meeting. Don't leave. It's just just the same link. It's I it's just the one meeting. Yes. Okay.
I'm back. Was that five minutes? Okay, Tashi. So stand by to resume the recording. Oh, Melanie, yes, you're here. Is Amanda in the meeting? Amanda? Okay. So ready, Tashi, to resume? I'm ready. Is my um, screen still being shared? Um, just one moment. Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Um, somebody's written to me. Can she send her chart? No, unfortunately, no, because we've done a lot of preparation with the charts and it's just not that kind of thing. Right. So, uh, thank you. Whoever wrote to me, uh, Patricia. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to resume on the count of three, one, two, three, go ahead. Hi. Okay. So it's the Venus pentagram, um, VPP and the seven gates and we are resuming, let's see the Venus pentagram workbook. And this is the volunteer slides portion. And thank you, Linda, again. So here are our volunteers for this beautiful, beautiful birth of Venus. Okay. So is our first person Camilla? Camelia, are you with me? Yes. Okay. I don't know why I can't see people. Hold on, let me see. There we go. I see you, Cami. Okay, hi. So here's Excuse your chart. Me. Excuse me one moment. Cami, just keep yourself muted and oh, only, okay. only unmute when you're speaking, just to stop the feedback. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, so the first thing I notice is that your VPP5 is going to be very activated because you have the moon at 12 Aries and Chiron at 17 Aries, right? And so then, as any good evolutionary astrologer has to do, you have to look at, at this is like a magnetic kind of energy, right? There's a moon Venus conjunction on your moon Chiron in the sixth. So we're gonna look at where is Mars in your chart since this is an Aries transit. And we see that Mars is also in Aries and it's retrograde in Aries in the seventh. And so the moon is coming to that Mars and Chiron is very slow moving, but all of it is opposite Uranus. And I noticed that you write in your journal that you actually had a fight <laughs> and Mars Uranus of course is about fighting and uh, Chiron Uranus is about learning to heal fighting and moon Chiron is to learn how to become emotionally very very unwounded by becoming very self-sufficient emotionally right and aligning yourself with your the way that I like to say it is just so easy if you're connected to God and your emotional reliance is on the divine, then you will not become a codependent person who thinks that satisfaction and happiness can be found outside of yourself. And so Moon Chiron, which I happen to have also, um, I, and with Mars, so I, I kind of know your chart opposite um, Uranus. <laughs> so hello, <laughs> hello me. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that I had to learn, which might help you, is how to resolve fights, how to use my willpower um, to align myself with the highest, best outcome for everybody, to never, ever, ever be revengeful, to never, ever think to be negative. Um, and your Uranus is in Libra and your Mars is in Aries. And your Venus, though, it, which rules that Uranus and your ascendant in Capricorn is all about what we've been talking about today. How much time do you have in your life really to get your work done that your soul sent you here to do? All right. And 
with all of with mars sitting right on your venus in that first gate chart i think there's going to be a lot of learning here you are getting somebody to tell you something look at that you know lucky and and the biceptal can be but you have to choose which way to go this is fate this is a a place where we make an intention to grow and it has to be deeply aligned with what our soul wanted us to do why we came here so of course meditation for me is always a very important answer for that inner self-reliance connecting ourselves to the divine and you have pluto in the 12th so that's always going to be an answer for you um Let's see, I wrote some other things here. Learning not to slam doors, all right? Learning not to just cut things off. I think that's very much that Mars, Chiron, Moon, Uranus lesson. And I always tell uh, my friends and clients whenever I see this, go and see, Mel, or now it's don't go and see, go to Netflix, get download, <laughs> somehow watch Mel Gibson's Apocalypto. And you're going to see this separation that people had this tribal separation people had that jeffrey talked so much about when he's first teaching ea he talked a lot about the trauma of uranus and the separation so when things are opposite uranus there's trauma and separation right especially the moon and so there's this emotional thing that but if only i had this and eventually you learn no it's an inner connection to the divine that will make you happy and feel satisfied. So we move from this sense of lack to this sense of satisfaction, and that's how we evolve. We don't, we don't stay stuck in the lack. And if you see Mel Gibson's Apocalypto, you'll see all of the separation and sacrifice that was going on in this movie. And to me, it looks like a lot of bad past lives and a collective bad past life for all of us to be working on. Um, so Venus in Capricorn being responsible, how you communicate. And also that Venus is pretty much in the new phase to having just left the North node and Ceres and Lilith and Juno, who just happened to be on the galactic center. So you learning to be a responsible communicator and really teaching what my friend said in the tarot, the truth about the truth to people really opening, um, that Gemini uh, learning to name things and, and studying natural law and really opening yourself up that way is the way that I think this uh, first gate is going to create a real healing in you. And because that first gate, if your time is accurate, that Chiron moon, I mean, if it's four minutes off, it's in the seventh house. And so, you know, when something's so close to a line like this, I tend to really talk and, and correlate and observe you and i don't know you very well but if it's in the sixth house which the moon seems to be um but that's you know 20 minutes off in hospitals you don't know it's a bridge house the virgo house so there's this need for humility humility and wanting to figure out okay well how do i take my Mars Uranus. Obviously, you, you've learned astrology. That's wonderful. That's very Mars Uranus. Finding your tribe and finding out how to relate well and harmoniously within that tribe and with others. And really using that Mars energy in Aries to really, really learn how to um, initiate and dream up really good ideas that Mars Uranus and the moon also. I mean, it's complicated. Do you have questions? Um, yes and no, Adam. Um, because the next, um, I'm sorry, I would, I'm not quite sure with, uh, okay with the terminology. So the, the next, um, what is it, con conjunction or? Um, that's going to be on March 18. That that's going to be exactly on my on that moon, right? Is that what? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It will be at 14 um, Aries, 14 Aries, 48. So it's right there. You know, it's very close. Yeah. Um, well, everything that you said was, was right. It was, it was a big thing for me learning. Um, 
how, how, how to be myself without accommodating everybody else because I, I need their love or accept, acceptance and everything. So it was the story of, of my life so far. And I just recently start, starting, started to realize how, how bad and how embedded this was in me because I wasn't aware of it that much. And I think that had also to do with the, the fact that Chiron now is, is squaring the nodes and, and also is coming closer to the square with Venus and it's going to activate all this grand uh, cross. <clears throat> so, um, but communicating and, 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 and teaching those things for me is, is what gives me the most pleasure to a point where I, I've never realized how much I, I like this until like last year when I started um, talking about this stuff more. And and that's what where I'm I'm determined finally to go to I mean, in in that direction. Great. <clears throat> well, I'm I'm sure you're going to be a wonderful teacher. You have a VPP up there in um, on your south node, so I have a feeling you've been a teacher before, and that the Kumari kiss, the this Venus energy, and this knowledge is something that you can definitely pioneer. And are you in Europe? Uh, I am from Europe, but I live in California. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah. And people, people, women are really responding to all of this wonderful new, because of the Me Too movement and the world, women are waking up and wanting to become stronger. And certainly astrology has always given us a lot of really lovely help. Okay, so let's see. I don't have any kind of timer here, so let me try to use the timing. Can she? Um, yeah, eight minutes. Okay. Are we, eight minutes is up, yeah. And, I, and we're done, right? That, yes. I, is that your eight minutes? Okay, and I'll watch it on the next one. All right. Thank you, Kim. I'll send you, a, I'll send you a quick chat message when it's time to move to the next one. Okay, and now it's... Okay. Okay, so that's it, Cammy. You're good? Yeah, thank you, Tashi and Linda and, and everybody. All right, Alexandra, are you here? Did she not make it? So we'll skip her then. Um, I'm and here. She's here. Oh, she's here. here. Okay. I don't see you. But I guess I don't. Um, I guess you have to speak. I did, but okay. Let me try to find you. Um, do you hear me now? I hear you. Yeah, I'm just trying to find okay. you. Hmm. Okay, well, I don't, I don't know. There you are. Okay, oh, you just have a picture of yourself. All yes, right. I cannot turn on the video. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right, so let's see. Your. Um, for some reason, I didn't make notes about yours. I wonder why. Very sorry. It's opposite your Saturn. Yes. And um, it's in your seventh house. And mm -hmm. so it's not, it's going to happen in the house of relationships and partnerships. I see. Exams. Okay. I'm so sorry. I must have somehow skipped you. I got everybody else because I see notes, but okay, let's just do this. So this is how I do it. I look at this, I look at Aries and 14 Aries is near her VPP five. It's at 17. I, I think that's three degrees is close enough. So it will activate one of your intentions as a soul, which was the Aries VPP, which I believe is that VPP is about the pioneer and all of us. All right. Okay. And you can, you can look online and see how long that Aries, um, when it started, what has gone on historically with it. You can learn about it and you can see how it affects you in the seventh house, which would be people who came into your life that you related with, that you were connected to. And then opposite your Saturn, which is basically a conjunct your Ceres and your Pluto and your Jupiter, would have to do with this business of self-empowerment always in the second house. Are you um, thinking about partnering with somebody for business reasons? Um, not at the moment. Okay. No. And how about your, I'm just trying to get a sense of what this mm -hmm. Saturn, Pluto, Ceres, Jupiter 
Um, how do you make a living with that second house? I work at some company, insurance company. Okay. And I'm, um, I'm starting to have to work um, as astrologer because I'm um, at astrology studies in, here in Belgrade. I'm in law school. So uh, I'm finishing second year and little by little, little I'm starting to work with clients. Okay. And so your second house is, I think you're, you're learning um, to be happy because of your own ability to choose to be happy, correct? Yes. And, you know, Rosicrucians say that the moon is either lunacy, ferocity, and madness, or happiness. And then I added enlightenment, joy, bliss. Okay. So I like the Rosicrucian astrology um, because it's spiritual. And so I've, I've always held on to that. In our, we call, astrologers call it their toolbox. I mostly have all evolutionary skills in my toolbox, but I kept a few things. And so happiness um, is certainly part of having Pluto in the second house because of Venus ruling the second house. So it's going to oppose all that. And I think it's this first gate for you is how are you going to get along with others? How are your relationships with others going to improve? The opposition as a transit is always a time of learning how to integrate in society better, the social gate as we become more integrated with others. Do you have, um, are you single? Are you looking for a partner? I'm married. You're I'm married. married. And, yes. Um, so is there maybe then with Pluto and Libra more self-empowerment in your marriage, issues of more awareness of self-empowerment, more awareness of happiness? It's, I, I could say that it's more about environment and happiness with relationships in general. In general. Okay, and that's good. In my well, um, marriage. Probably because in evolutionary astrology, we use the eighth house for marriage. So that was probably my mistake. The seventh house is more about our interaction with others one-on-one, -on -one, partners mm -hmm. and people one-on-one. -on -one. And the eighth house is marriage. So I um, definitely always have to remember that do you have any questions for me you have three minutes um hmm. uh, for me uh, what i'm concerned the most about this uh, venus my venus in my chart is actually uh square with the uh, pluto with the um, saturn and um uh, with the uh, uh, jupiter so can you please clarify a little bit from the point on the so the vpp the current mm -hmm. vpp is at 20 um capricorn and it's sitting on your venus in the yes. fifth house mm -hmm. and pluto is also basically sitting there because it will retrograde and go back to 19 and so it will cross over your venus another time um and in the fifth house well we have to know a little bit about your life an opening square is always a crisis in action and so mm -hmm. pluto is squaring your nodes so this pluto jupiter business or i would say all of it really saturn series pluto um do you have children uh not yet no and i think that this the skip step for me if i was consulting you i would say that this is probably this is a lifetime where you decide to have children you value yes, it is <laughs> yeah exactly that right but it's like a really taking profound decision it's not okay i will have kids it's now really something like i decided to do in the to try to have children in the next year during the next year because before it was okay i will have children one day but now it's more like decision to, to do it <laughs> and as a woman i i would I would tend to believe that very high souls probably want to come and be birthed through you because you can give them a life where they can learn about their soul. And that would be very important for you to do that. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Thanks. And then of course, learning, learning to understand what is money, you know, Pluto in the second house, how do you, do the right work so you attract to yourself exactly what you should be having so you find the right work 
because mm. you're using your talent and you're doing uh, the right karmic energy level work for yourself. I think that's very important with Pluto in the second house and as a skip step for sure. Yes, yes, I understand. Because before where they have also Saturn uh, squaring my Venus. And mm -hmm. Well, that just means be happy, be, be responsible, use your time wisely. What Jeffrey mm -hmm. said in slide nine. Yeah, I had uh, during past years, a lot of transformation regarding that. And I can see improvement, but I also feel that need to really do what, to use my talents, to, to make living out of my talents, not just from the work. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. All right. And here we have Jennifer. So your um, third VPP is very activated. Um, Jupiter is at 16. That's not even two degrees away from 1448. And so it's going to hit your eighth house Jupiter. Um, so we're, we have to look, of course, to your Mars. And we see that your Mars is at 12 Virgo, conjunct Pluto, and the Moon, and Uranus. And there's a quinx. There's an inconjunct here from Jupiter to Mars. So I think that the triceptile that's in the chart of gate one, as well as the activation of your Mars-Jupiter series, Juno, Pluto, Moon, Uranus, Vesta, Quincunx, is going to really give you a sense of um, how do I go forward? And the Quincunx is humility or humiliation. We're learning humility. This is the opening quincunx, so it's the early one where you really have to learn to serve, all right? And the way that it's described by Jeffrey in EA is that he says all of the talent at Leo, of the fire trine of Leo, Aries Leo, now comes to this Aries Virgo feeling of, okay, the bridge energy of Virgo. How do I get ready to integrate myself into the social sphere and get along with people and do the work I'm supposed to do um, and the life I'm supposed to have with others, I have to learn humility to serve. And so this quincunx, you have a lot of this. And I believe that this gate will test you in a certain way. Where are you, Jennifer? I'm trying to find you. I can see you. Um, I just unmuted. I'm right here. Okay. Can you see me? I'm trying to find you. There's, uh, I don't know how to use this very well. You must be here somewhere. I'm going to find Tashi, yeah. two more chart, two charts down from this one. Okay, two charts down. I see Tashi. There you are, Jennifer Cobb. I got you. Okay, sorry. Oh, but, but you're uh, on the wrong chart. I'm on the wrong chart. All right. So I'm, I'm reading the wrong person's chart. Keep going. One more. Did it? No, back. Back. <laughs> there we go. Okay. No. It's that one, yes. Okay, I started on the right chart. Okay, and I found you, Jennifer. All right, so, um, so Jeffrey said it means align your ego or personal will to God's will, humility or humiliation. Mars is faster, so this is the 150 quinx energy, and this creates an inferiority complex, and you have to you fix this inferiority complex with this Aries Virgo one by really understanding you're entering entering the social sphere on god's terms or the divine's term all right and honoring the other's needs and then the crises in our lives abate they go away but we create crisis after crisis with virgo while we're complaining so much so i i have said about this compliment more complain less <laughs> and um it's a kundalini mantra that i like kundalini yoga so i think that with the jupiter in the eighth you may have some financial opportunities you may have some philosophical opportunities of course jupiter rules natural law in evolutionary astrology so um, hopefully you'll be able to study um, natural law and really understand your aries virgo complexity here and of course, I recommend to everybody the wonderful book that Linda did for Jeffrey, which is 
the glossary. And that book is the best thing ever, ever, ever. It's better than ice cream. Okay. It's so good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and I, if you, you can read and study in that book, you'll really understand your quincunx here. But I think that the gate one opens that up. And then we look to see where, where is that Mars in Capricorn and that's making that biceptal for you, right? Do you remember there was a transiting Mars to the Venus moon? So it'll be in your fourth, all right? Just at the end of your fourth. So that suggests that the pathfinding that you have to do is deep. It's that fourth house, right? And the eighth house. So it's a deep internalizing strengthening of your um, purpose, Capricorn, your ability to work with the world. Um, your what what you want to do because you have Pluto Mars in a new phase. What is it you came here to do? You have something new you want to do. And you're one of those souls that has Uranus right balsamic to Pluto, okay, and Mars um, conjunct it. And I have actually a lot of clients with this configuration and they're trailblazers. I call, I call you guys the revolutionary evolutionaries. And so what is it that you, you came here to do? And I think that that pathfinding in your fourth house, family, what's going on with family? And of course, Pluto is sitting on your self node. So what's happening with your fourth, fifth? It's what's going on with your family. Do you want me to answer that or are you just putting that out there? No, you can answer everything because I'm, I'm, I've said what I want to say. So now I can answer your questions. Um, you're, you're right on the dot. And uh, what's going on with my family is that I'm just in the midst of a total trajectory change in this lifetime. And I think it's one of many lifetimes. And um, so I had huge abandonment with both parents. Um, and I have uh, had a child. She's 17 now. And I have shown up to be a very caring, supportive Cancerian mother. And in doing that, have created the mothering for myself that I needed. So I've got the safety, security. And I'm just, um, I've had about a year and a half of very quiet contemplation and uh, connection with the divine. And I, ha I have that sense of just kind of waiting for my future to unfold. Well, Pluto sitting, Pluto's going to go back and forth over your south node. Yes. It, you know, the fifth house, it, it can bring a lot of wonderful things. But in evolutionary astrology, we work on our creative self-expression. And we align our personal will with the divine will, Leo Aquarius. And I'm sure you've surrendered to do that because I know Pluto, it doesn't give us a lot of leeway to do anything else. We learn it. And it's been there long enough that, and that's wonderful that your child and you, and, and she will eventually leave home, right? To go to school. And that will be part of all of this too. It's coming up quick. I got a year and a bit, but um, I feel uh, anticipation and excitement about that. Yeah. Um, um, can yeah. you just talk briefly about um, where Venus is currently? Because it's also sitting right on my south node. Um, you mean Venus today? Yeah. Where I don't know where Venus is today. Oh. So one or two Aries, right? Oh, earlier I thought you said, what is it? Um, current, current Venus VPP is 20 degrees Capricorn, which is my south node. That's what the I'm current asking. VPP is 20 Capricorn, right? Yeah. And it's on your south node. Oh, I have to move on. I answered that though. When you go back and listen to this, you'll see. Okay. And then is this in the next one? No, did I go the wrong way? No. Wendy. Keep okay. going. That's it. Okay. So odd. Okay, Wendy. Um, so let's see. The VPP in Aries is in the 11th and it's on your, well, it's not on your VPP one, but there is um, a gate there. So the, seven, the first gate will be in the 11th house and it's, mm, it's not on your 22 Aries VPP one, but it's gonna activate it for sure. So working with your tribe, 
The biceptile falls in your seventh, 11th, all right? So the early Capricorn energy is in the seventh. And of course, the seventh gate is in the 11th. So the energy of the one-on-one, -on -one, the counseling one-on-one -on -one, or the working one-on-one -on -one with people and the tribe um, of the 11th house will be activated by this VPP. Your VPP one is opposite your Mars. So this VPP, even though it's only at 14, it may activate this. You know, everybody responds to transits differently. And that could get you wanting to do something new and it may bring new creative energies to you. And certainly it can activate the pioneering part of you. What, what's interesting about that is my south node of Mars is 15 Aries. I mean, 15 Libra. Oh. So it's going to hit that south node. Oh, very good. So th there's the pioneering. And when I read here that you're beginning to do these abundance workshops, the sacred marriage, and you're going to do the Venus journey chakra gates. And I think the more that you learn about this, the more you're going to see there's so much to teach and learn. All right. And you'll, I think that this is the pioneering of you taking your creative self-expression and putting yourself out there, you know, as somebody fun to teach things to, all right? And then um, Mars will be, I, I see this as a very pioneering period for you. I think you'll look back at this period as a time where, wow, that's when I started that. And there, there's just so many women who need help with understanding the moon Venus ascent and the descent periods. And the more you've already studied it. So the more you know about it, and I, I think you can magnetize a living to yourself and um, a creative self-expression and a pioneering going forward. You must have lots of questions because you know astrology so well. Yeah. Thank you, Tashi. The thing that um, really came to me because during the Venus transit 2004 to 2012, I was having huge downloads of information from Mary and I was studying the Mayan calendar and I was studying the Venus transit and I was studying this whole, I learned about, that's when I studied with Adam Gainsbourg with the Venus cycle and, you know, all of this and the gates and all that. And um, what I'm hoping to do is, teach the chakra um, piece, the Venus chakra gates, but also take them through the ritual um, correlated to the pentagram and literally about embodying Venus through, from the heavens, through the body, down through the earth and receive up through the earth. The whole, it's like very um, integrative. So it won't just be um, basic. It won't be a astro a lot of women aren't going to know astrology that come to yeah, take from me. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I know. I mean, it, it, the, astro, the astrological knowledge that's needed to understand all of this is really daunting. <laughs> when I, I've been writing about it and studying it, and you just have to, at the end of the day, close your eyes and go, that's enough for today. And then pick up. I mean, I'm a Gemini, so I love to learn, but there's a lot to learn here. And I think working with somebody like Wendy who knows it and can then take you through things without you having to know everything is lovely, you know. And I early in my life when I worked with astrologers, they knew lots of things that they didn't tell me what how it worked, but they told me what was going on. And so I think that's great for you. Yeah, I think the thing that's really cool is that when it all first started, um, the Venus cycle was right on my North Node in Gemini. Yeah. And so all these points have been hitting all these different things in my chart as I've been receiving the information. So it's been, it is a really beautiful, beautiful cycle. And it's amazing to learn it and receive it, like integrate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think with your VPP five right on um, the, and your ascendant descendant on the galactic center and your Jupiter there, I think it's very important for you to be a teacher of natural law, a Damon soul teacher of natural law. Yeah. yeah. And Thank especially you, you know, having it, you have um, that one. And then 
the one that's coming in Scorpio, it's earlier Scorpio, so it doesn't really hit your Neptune or your VPP3, but the next one's in Scorpio. So there's a lot of activity in this 11th, 5th house for you. And I, I feel like you'll get very creative as you are teaching. And yeah. just use that Gemini to just really just keep learning. I, I can't, I think in the last six months. Are you kidding? Look at that Gemini and my right. third house. That's a never, that's never going to stop. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't wait to share what I learned with you. I want, I, I have your email. Yeah, we'll have to talk. <laughs> you have to. I, I just can't wait to, I, I want you to just, I want every woman who can do this to teach every woman everything. <laughs> well, I will say, I just really appreciate that and the technical piece that you're doing because that is not always my strongest suit because I'm coming from receiving the um, more philosophical, you know, all of that. And I can do the technical too, but that's always secondary for me. I have moon and Capricorn and I'm the same way, you know, just the same way. My moon and Capricorn, it can figure anything out, but my Gemini is like, but where's the time to play? <laughs> if I have to work and figure it all out. <laughs> So, but that's why I love to keep going back to Jeffrey's quote, you know, figure out what you have to do with your moon in Capricorn. And, and as Pluto's coming to your moon, I think you're really going to be able to help women as it, it goes over your moon and Lilith, you know, and that'll be your eighth house. Pluto's coming. Yes. Into, it's just going into your eighth house and you'll see the support you get from the universe when you do this work. Yeah. Thank you, Tashi. You're welcome. Tashi, um, Wendy had a question there in the first paragraph, January 8th, Capricorn Morningstar. Okay. Is that, yeah. Uh, yes, it was a morning star. It was a retrograde Venus Sun conjunction. I have figured this all out for you, Wendy. You will, you will be so happy. I took oh, I see. And then after that, it moved to evening star. I get it now. You get it? Yeah. And it took me, I would just be like, oh, and I wrote on my computer. I just didn't star. understand. I didn't understand. I'm thinking, why does it say morning star when we're going to evening star? So, it but is I understand. Morning star. It's still a morning star and it transitions. And yeah. I've got all the guides of, of how it all happens. So you'll be able to see them soon. And I figured it out from astro.com and there's a, there's a link. I don't have it in here, but it's in my last talk. Uh, if I could find it, I'd throw it in. Okay. Well, I really understand it now because I have the whole chart of it, but um, how it actually works, but all, more information is always good. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, oh, Carolyn is next. Sorry. Where is Carolyn? Previous. There we go. Here you are. Okay. So the VPP2 is very close to this first gate. VPP2 is up here. You see it? And your Juno is at seven Aries. And so the, the seventh gate is at 14 Aries, but your VPP2 is at 16 Aries. So it's a 12th house uh, first gate for you of these seven gates. If I misspoke, it's the first gate of the seven gates in your 12th house on your VPP2 and your VPP2 natally is 16 Aries. So, and it's opposite all of your Sun Neptune, and I can see that you haven't been feeling well. And so certainly, if the VPP is a Kumari kiss, and if the opening gate is this biceptile that is getting you to choose the right path, then um, you have some learning to do, it looks like, with how to meditate and how to get that Neptune in your life and in your body more conscious with the VPP opposite your Neptune sun. And so um, do you meditate? My shamanic teacher has called me her non-meditator. Um, I meditate on and off. I'm starting with Deepak Chopra and Oprah on the 19th. Okay. But I, I have meditated a lot, and I have not med med meditated a lot. Okay, well, my, my suggestion is with your Sun-Neptune conjunction in the sixth, 
the, the sixth house, Jeffrey always talks about an NEA as a bridge house, all right, and a bridge sign. And of course, we know that it's about self-improvement and we know it's about health. And I call it learning to live in the body house. <laughs> Not my favorite thing. Right. And so whenever Neptune is in the sixth house, we have a person or Pisces on the cusp of the sixth house or somehow the sixth house is related to Neptune by transit or anything. We have diseases that are hard to diagnose and we have a sensitivity to everything around us. All of a sudden you can just develop an allergy out of nowhere or you can find yourself not able to handle people or you're suddenly telepathic and now you don't feel well because of that either. Okay, there's um, because you're too sensitive. And so to me, when it comes to Neptune, the way to evolve, of course, is sharing, caring, inclusion. Sixth house is a charity house for me. When I see a lot of that, I go, do you do charity work? Yes. That's yes. very good. And But meditation to me is even more important. And then, of course, the moon. And I know we've talked before, you have a child. And so serving service to the child moon in Virgo in the sixth is very good. But also being an example to everybody of a person who knows how to live a meditative journey. So sometimes I call meditation meditation. Yeah. And sometimes I call it meditation, but I think it's extremely important to recapitulate with a chart like yours daily. And that means play things backwards. And if you felt anything glitchy, play it backwards and then see yourself correcting it, course correcting it with sharing, caring and inclusion. And just keep holding the picture of self-empowerment. Um, because Sun Neptune, as we know in evolutionary astrology, we have to be very, very careful with the sixth and the twelfth house that we are not giving away our power and finding ourselves in a sadomasochistic situation where we're a victim or a martyr and we're doing too much for everybody and not enough for ourselves. And so that's what I wrote. And also bridge work, you know, bridge work so that your seventh house planets, um, because the VPP will be on your Mercury in October, okay, what can you do um, to prepare yourself for the coming up VPP in October? And go to this link and read about the um, inferior conjunction that's coming in October, 26th of October, okay? Go to this in the sky.org and read about that because that's going to land on your Mercury, Caroline. Why should I pay attention? Oh my God, I got lucky. I, I seem to use my, maybe my willpower to meditate, to eat well, to exercise. And then I just go, okay, I'm hitting the couch for three weeks. And it's, I keep trying to get myself into a routine. And I'm not, I'm going on 70 in October, and I'm not, apart from teaching school, which I did for many years, to get into a routine to serve myself, to serve my body temple, if I'm not in my teacher's meditation center, which is now closed, it's, it's, I'm just returning to keep trying. Yeah, chop wood, carry water, you know, just every day. Yeah, yeah that's so what I thought so. earlier. When I would just say to Sashi, to do yeah. Tashi, right. chop wood, carry water. With me, it's, it's um, bring in the wood, wash the dishes. Well, your Virgo house likes to do all of that. And I think it's really important that you really, really read a lot in the EA about the sixth house in Virgo and really just keep teaching yourself, just keep assimilating that you need to nurture and fix your body and your life through routine. And Neptune is, doesn't like routine, you know? It's not, not good at it. And Libra tends to always, I think, put things outside of itself. And so you, you have to just internalize this. Your moon in Virgo 
is quite happy to do it. Your son Neptune just forgets. <laughs> yes. Moon 9th, I have hopefully my last um, scan, which involves radioactive iodine to make sure that lumps that are within the normal range stay are still normal. My GP thinks that the hospital is covering their rear ends that like you said neptune in in the six with the hard sun to diagnose, yeah very and, hard and i think this the transiting mars that was part of the biceptile that's part of this first gate is opposite your uranus okay yep. and your vpp1 so there could be a gift of information that you could learn how to figure out this sun neptune how to master this and take that ninth house natural law and study natural law and really through astrology uranus at zero zero cancer really really try to get a handle on your sun neptune conjunction and what it's going to take with mars and that huge capricorn stellium to finish this life and accomplish what you came here to accomplish and so I would take that very seriously. And then I think your Neptune will be easier to handle. Okay, I'm ready for the next. All Thank right. you, Tashi. Yep. Okay, so in Dawn's case, and thank you so much for, you wrote a lot, Dawn, and I did read it all. And it was all very interesting. I don't know that I can respond to all of it. This gate falls, the, the seventh gate, the first gate of the seven gates, the Moon-Venus conjunction at 14 Aries falls in your sixth house, right on the cusp it looks like. And the interesting thing to me is that it's gonna quinx your Pluto and Virgo, all right? So it's going to, which is opposite your Chiron. So I think it's gonna activate some of that. Um, your VPP2 is a little bit too far away for me, um, but you know, I don't know yet. I'm still observing and correlating, so maybe you can tell us. The bridge work on your Aries Virgo sixth house is seems to be the work of this first gate health. The biceptile is from your second to your sixth. And so I think your work is changing and you've been talking about becoming a grandma, right? So working with your family, um, we don't see the fourth house here, but we see the the depth of um, Pluto opposing your moon. And that would certainly bring us, and the VPP point opposing your moon would bring us right to motherhood for you. Does that make sense? It totally does. I'll be uh, uh, taking care of my grandkids and um, being full-time granny nanny, and I'll be loving every minute of it. Yeah, and so that's the sixth house work and selfless serving. And then that Mars right there in the second. But I think the most powerful thing here is there'll be some adjustments. Like you won't have as much time maybe for your friends, Uranus, Pluto, right there at the end of your 10th, 11th. Um, and also what I felt was this strong sense of you wanting to maybe teach these children things. I just don't know how old they are with Pluto opposite your moon, that maybe the soul part of you was coming in to be a Damon soul kind of teacher to these kids. Does that make They're, sense? Yeah, the, the second one, the first one is three today, and the second one uh, was born on January 31st. Okay, so no gardening with the second one, but the first one can at least eat tomatoes in the garden. Yeah. So, Little three-year-olds like strawberries. I don't know. I forget where you live. <laughs> We're in Wisconsin. Okay, no strawberries yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's amazing because I'll be leaving, you know, a full-time job to do that. And it's good that I leave that because it's not following my purpose. And I'll be able to spend time writing. Um, I'll be away from family up here i'll be an hour away and i'll be down there so when i'm not babysitting i'll be in an apartment you know so that's the quincunx from your 
from your um, this this first gate at 14 Quinx is your Pluto and that's that adjustment. There'll be a lot of adjustments to make and that's you quitting the job, the 10th house and the sixth house. That makes a lot of sense. Money will be a, a different type of thing. Right. Um, that's the biceptile with the Mars ruling it in the second house. So that'll be a second house, sixth house. Have you figured out how you'll attract money, how you'll make money? I'll be, I'll be okay. I've uh, built up a store, if you will. <laughs> and so uh, I'll be okay for the next five years. Um, yeah, I read that. I read that. But it won't be, it's not going to be, you know, you know, the old saying chicken or feathers, it'll be more like feathers. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's what this, that's what this looks like. Uh, that's how this VPP and the is working opposite the moon, the current one, and then that's how the first gate in the sixth house is working. I feel okay about that. I'm good with that. I don't need, I, I have more than what I need. And um, I'm- Did you I'm, wanna ask me anything on this second one? I didn't see a question here. I didn't know that we were supposed to ask questions. No, no, not at all. No, no, I, it was just really interesting to read it. It seems like you're really learning how to work with it, and that's exciting. That's where I'm at, yeah. Yeah, and you'll probably have more time. The next one that's coming um, is close to your ascendant. Is that your progressed moon on the outside? Um, it's that, at three Scorpio. The one in October is at three Scorpio for everybody. That's the transit. Oh, it's a transit, yeah. It would be gone anyway by then, so. All the, right. The center is my progressions. Okay. Um, so let's see what else we can say about this. Again, you have a VPP at 28 Gemini. So, you know, just a lot of teaching and uh, as Pluto is going over your moon, I think that's just such a wonderful, the opposition. Your moon is on the nodes of Pluto. And so the opposition just showing you teaching these children. Children need evolved beings, grandmothers, evolved beings. They're very evolved souls to have you come in and be teaching them. I'm feeling so blessed that this has come. I mean, I've been watching it for a long time and wondering exactly what it would bring. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, when my, my son started saying this to me that this would be a good idea, I was like, well, it fits every single paradigm that I'm seeing you know come together here so yes it would be a wonderful thing can we get everybody else on board is everybody else on board i'm on board i'm all for it <laughs> well and and that's you know you've been learning that with your uranus behind pluto the sharing caring inclusion of evolutionary astrology the revolutionary evolutionary energy of that and and you know that's happening for you in the 10th house of your family and so there you are learning that lesson. And you're eager to, to do it. And, but I'm sure there was some healing because Chiron is opposite that, you know, uh, Uranus Pluto. And I read that it took a while for everybody to agree and, and for it to, to go. But there's that healing of that Chiron um, in the fifth. And working with those children is going to be very healing for you. I think so. I think it's what I'm meant for. And it's interesting that it starts on this first gate because it's activating that Chiron Pluto. Yeah. Being at 1448. Right. Right on it. Okay. It's probably time to go on to Erica. Thank you so much, Tashi. You're welcome. Oh, I didn't see this one. Sorry. Erica. All right. Gate one is near your VPP in the 12th. So your VPP in Aries is at 11 Aries. So it's pretty close, all right? 1149 to 1448. That's definitely, it's going to activate one of your VPP. So what does it mean when a VPP gets activated? This is a Kumari kiss. This is a place of luminous brilliance, of Venusian excellence, okay? So it's in the 12th house. And it's in Aries and your Mars is right there on the galactic center. 
opposite one of your other VPPs, all right? And so learning evolutionary astrology, learning natural law is this ninth house stellium that you have here. And this VPP is bringing you a gift. Maybe it's just learning this stuff about Venus. Pluto is sitting on your uh, Venus, basically. It's not sitting there, but it's in between your Saturn Venus. So I'm sure it feels like it's sitting on it. It's moving through your Capricorn stellium. Did you have a recent change of status when it went over your midheaven? Yes. Um, I quit my job abruptly. Like it was like a cataclysmic event. Yeah. That's Pluto. Put we yeah. <laughs> happy Pluto. If you watch Jeffrey's videos, he calls it happy Pluto. Now, okay. Okay. Pluto just, it, it has the lovely task of taking away the things that are not aligning us with our soul's desires. Yeah, there, <laughs> once we, there was not much conscious, conscious decision in that at all. So yeah, Pluto, that was totally unconscious. <laughs> as you get older, Pluto feels a little bit more conscious. I don't know if forever. You know. Okay. <laughs> it's very, it's our soul. It's very deep, you know? Um, yeah. And so it's going to activate that. Um, so I want, when I wrote here, I said, go back to right work. Because for you, this quote is very important. Capricorn represents how you're going to establish your sense of personal authority, Leo, in the context of the society you live in. The need to establish personal authority is basic. When done rightly, you receive recognition. But you're doing this also so that your desire to receive um, personal recognition has to do with this Capricorn stellium. What's right work for you? Well, right now I find myself, I am, I'm now what they call a PCA, a personal care assistant. I'm taking care of a woman who has, her life has completely hit the floor. Mm -hmm. um, she, her life is just horrible. Right now I'm doing three loads of her laundry. Um, I cleaned her entire bedroom today. Um, I did like three loads of dishwashing for her. Um, well, I think you're moving. And then I, I heard you talking about a martyr and I'm really concerned about that. Mm -hmm. So when I came home today, I made sure I did everything I needed to do for myself too. Good. Good. The moon, I think in the 10th house is very nurturing. You know, moon in Capricorn has, in Capricorn's house has a lot of dignity. It's very nurturing. So your moon up there is happy to nurture others. It's, it's happy to be seen as a nurturer. Yeah, so but other, other people don't see it that way either. Some people just, I hate that. Well, it's very important to not, to, this is what I say. When people say, how are you? I go, I am as you see me. And then the other thing is, your opinion of me doesn't really matter. My opinion of me is what matters. I know that these are Facebook kind of corny quotes, but they kind of work. We need these mantras, you know? Like you have to, with your sun, moon, and Aquarius, you have to not be traumatized by other people's opinions of you. But like compassion is seen as weak for whatever reason. Okay, well, kindness is often seen as weakness, but kindness is strength. Yeah. A unless you're not being kind to yourself. And then, you know, that whole, you have a VP, this is activating your VPP in the 12th house. So it is a gift for you to look at where you are really very self-honoring and pioneering and loving the part of yourself. You're a little genius with your Uranus mercury you know look at that uranus mercury neptune oh you're one of these this i love this period of uranus neptune and saturn this is when the berlin wall fell down all right this is when russia fell apart as a country and so the dissolution of neptune saturn and also we call neptune saturn in one of my other toolboxes an architect aspect um you you are a dreamer you're a builder you're a daemon soul you you're you'd be a very good astrologer take it seriously i i mean but then you have to fit all that into the actual world like there are many bills i need to pay <laughs> and there are many like rules i have to follow 
So it's like, how do you well, you learn live your dreams and do all those things, you know? You figure out which Capricorn rules you can live and which part of consensus society you can operate within with all that Capricorn. And then you look at your second house and you figure out how you can magnetize money to yourself by using your Gemini mind. And you'll see that you have Uranus Mercury conjunction. And so probably eventually um, you could use astrology and, and you know, some of us make money as an astrologer. I do. I pay my bills as an astrologer. I'm a lot older. It's taken me a long time. And it wasn't always what I did. Until I met evolutionary astrology, I really didn't want to be a professional astrologer. But now I do because I see how helpful it can be to others. Um, yeah. I, I, would like everyone, I would like everyone to be able to read their own chart, you know, because I, I get a lot of value in understanding what's happening by looking at my own chart yeah but sure. it's hard for me to look at someone else's chart and tell them what's going on in their life i don't know why that well is, because but. a daemon soul is not interested in just taking information sticking it into other people's heads and natu natural law is something that is experienced and it's observed and it's felt and it's lived and so you don't want to just give people a roadmap. You, you want to teach them how to read a roadmap. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you're young and your Mercury ruling your second house, you'll probably always do two things. You'll make money doing two things. That's what Gemini on the second house can mean. But naming things and teaching people is a very noble way for you to earn money. And with this VPP in your 12th house, it's this is the time for you because of the mars um opposite your jupiter is to figure out what you want to the, remember the bicep towel that i was talking about yeah so that that mars making that bicep towel to this first gate is in your ninth house it's in zero capricorn and it opposes your jupiter at two cancer and so that part of that would be, well, what do I learn and how do I nurture myself and how do I nurture others? And so this first gate is you learning to be a nurturer. And I think your 10th house moon likes that. And so this, this biceptile is saying, is this a good choice for me? Try it and see if nurturing, I mean, do you know about nurses make quite a lot of money, by the way. I I, I was a nurse, but I wasn't, I, that's the job I quit. I wasn't a nurse, but I was a medical assistant. I didn't like the way people were receiving care and I didn't like the clinic environment that I was operating within. All of it was very frustrating for me that I left in a very cataclysmic way. So now money is different. Money is very different. I'm making much less money than I was before, but I feel like I'm nurturing in a way that's true to my soul now. Well, that's good. Okay, I've got to move on. Um, but that's good. Keep, okay. keep up the effort. All right, thank you. Okay. Melanie, our current VPP squares your Pluto at 20 Libra. Are you here, Melanie? I'm here. Okay. So um, that was the first thing I noticed. And it's transiting in your second house but it's not close to your vpp3 it's in a different sign and this one um the aries one for you is right close to your vpp2 and opposite exactly your moon and pluto is squaring your moon so i figured there's probably a lot of good second house what is my value how do i want to make money right work um, a, a bunch of questions. I mean, it's a pretty activated first gate and an activated VPP, right? The current VPP in Capricorn. It's very active, squaring your Pluto. So let me just say this. No matter how much I learn about the VPP, I'm still an evolutionary astrologer who always looks at Pluto first. And you have a Pluto moon Lilith conjunction, which has got to be interesting. And the first gate, um, 
that's coming up in your fourth house, what's going on with your mother, your home, your family, uh, your friends, the 11th house, Pluto square, second house, uh, you'll have to tell me a little bit, or your own motherhood. Someone else had something like this, and she was thinking of becoming a mother. What's going on for you, Melanie? Um, I don't see a lot happening for me right now mother-wise. I just had some really deep healing happen um, between me and my dad. Um, the, a lot of focus right now for me, I feel like there's a lot of past trauma that's, that energy is getting freed up to go um, forward into me using that energy in my work and um, carrying out my, my dharma. And I feel um, a lot of that trauma is responsible for a lot of the resistance that I feel around doing my work. And so it's just appropriate that a lot of that stuff is just kind of getting tidied up right now. But I, um, I'm still, I'm starting to feel a little bit more excited and, and eager to put myself out there, but I'm still nervous and I haven't done it quite yet. And I think part of that is just because I know that I have to commit and really do it um, right or, you know, what is right, but I have to actually show up for it. And I'm um, feeling a little bit lazy as well. Yeah. You said that. And I, I thought, wow, Pluto in the second house squaring your Pluto and you're feeling lazy. And I just, I really was like, I wonder what it is. And when I think of lazy, I think of Taurus and I think of earth when I think of lazy, right? Yeah. I think that, that Jupiter is influencing um, that, that part of it, that there's a, there are a lot of things that are around my path that feel like they almost come too easily. Some um, conjunction. Yeah. 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 And so, um, and a lot of the, the place where I draw my strength is my, my Neptune in the first house in Sagittarius. That does a lot to support me and help me. So I think I, I kind of take things for granted sometimes. And the part where I have to put the work in, I can fall short. But when I do apply myself, things come very quickly for me. Uh, also, um, I've been working on my health uh, this past year, I'm starting to figure out what my body wants to eat to, to um, feel okay. And um, just getting really specific what time of day to eat, you know, um, all sorts of things like that. And I realize a, a big part of me not getting the full effects from that is I'm having uh, huge issues with my thyroid. I recently was able to um, figure out that that my thyroid's so low because of um, I'm not doing my work. It's uh, blockages on my throat chakra. So I think me just kind of taking the plunge is going to help clear up a lot of that. Uh, my thyroid, I think, is affecting my energy level and also adding to resistance. And so I think just taking that first step would clear up a lot and um, give me the momentum that I need. Well, I think with Pluto squaring your Pluto in the second house, finding out your right work and realizing that there's only so much time to do your work in your life, to fulfill your soul's requirements is gonna be crucial to you. And with this uh, first gate opposite your moon, to seriously really look at your moon Pluto Lilith and make that connection to your work um, the nurturing aspect of the 10th house of your work more important and look at your sun at 19 and your Jupiter at 20 and your Pluto at 20 and think about and your Neptune at 19 and think about transiting Pluto going over 19 18 19 and 20 mm -hmm. and then there's your Chiron at 18 and then there's your nodes at 19 so this mm -hmm. Pluto is activating everything in your chart not everything but a lot of stuff in your chart right and mm -hmm. so the ninth house sun is a daemon soul sun. And so learning more about yourself as a daemon soul and learning more about natural law, very important. And I think you'll realize there's just not enough hours in the day to learn about yourself as a daemon soul and what to do with that while you're on the planet. Yeah. yeah well, um, pretty much right. I've, so I've been getting all sorts of, 
um, support and training and guidance just directly from my guides um, really ever since 2012. It, I feel like I've been in like constantly in school, you know, and they're just kind of constantly with me and feeding me information anytime I come, right. come up against something or I have a question. Now I feel like I'm being kicked out of the nest. Um, I've put together a website. I'm just so afraid to launch it because I that's going to be a big coming out um, in my community in a way around things that I'm, I'm currently very private about. I've well, had, I had a lot of trauma in my childhood around um, rejection and just being very alone and not trusting other people to um, be around me if I'm being um, authentic. Well, you have a sun Neptune. Um, the sun is closing in on the sun Neptune square. So it's a crisis in consciousness square in evolutionary astrology. Uh, that's the way we look at that square. And so I think having the courage to just be your authentic self with that sun, and you'll find strength if, mm -hmm. you, if you launch it. And the VPP, if you think of it as a Kumari kiss, and you think of it sitting there helping you um, in the fourth, which likes to maybe be private, but opposite your moon Pluto, which has a lot of work to do in the world, that 10th yeah. house moon juno june everything up there in the 10th and the 9th is leadership and so remember what jeffrey said there's only so much time to figure out what you're supposed to do and then there's only so much time to do it mm -hmm. and so with pluto squaring your pluto it's time to do it i, I feel that and i just had a nodal return and that just kind of i feel like that set off um, a lot for me all my my timer started buzzing very loudly right yeah, right when that happened yeah, they definitely do. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like you're on the right track. Just put your website up. Where, which part of the world do you live in? Um, I live in Olympia, Washington. Oh, you can put up a website in Washington. <laughs> I know. And I've got, I'm, I'm plugged into a, a pretty new agey community and stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I feel like the things that I am able to accomplish um, on my own just through journey work and when I'm I'm put to work in the in the journey realm constantly and I'm being told like I have to actually make myself available to help others with that too and it's just that's that's new territory for me I'm I guess I'm just a little bit nervous I would write this on your fridge sharing caring inclusion yeah. okay and I, it's, I'm I, I um, apologize for asking you where oh, you're sure I just was, I, I guess if I ask those questions, I want people to say like middle America where nobody will let me be in Australia. Oh yeah. I'm so and sorry. I'm not worried about it. Okay. I'm so sorry. All right. No so, worries. Thank you. Sarah D. Let's look at you. Our next VP is on her VPP five. I'm starting slightly differently with you. Um, so it says October C slide three. So I just want to remind you, you can go here and look at this and see everything technically that will be happening on, 20, on the 26th of October when the Morningstar and Fury conjunction um, happens on your, what is it happening on? It looks like it's happening on your uh, North Node more or less and your VPP5, all right? So that's gonna be, I think what's happening now is getting you ready for that since that's such a big event. This gate is on your VPP3 in your third house on your Venus. So your VPP3 is at 12 Aries and it's on your Venus. Are you very, very creatively, artistically gifted? Your VPP on Venus in the fifth? I, I am a really creative person, yeah. I always have been. And, you, and the more that you nurture it, the better it will be. I, the example that I used in my last talk was a guy who has a VPP on his Venus and he's an artist and he works as an artist for a living and he does well and loves it and really just is so synced up artistically with nature and natural law. Okay. And so the ruler is in the ninth Mars and it's in the same degree where tr of transiting Pluto. So I think this is a time where you're making a lot of easy transitions because of the ruler being trying to your Venus to learn about how to take your creative self-expression and integrate it with what you're learning about natural law. Your second house, Juno and Neptune, 
are receiving um, the biceptile Mars is pretty close to your Juno, okay? And Pluto's pretty close to your Neptune. So the biceptile energy that we know is affecting the second fifth for you, for everybody, what kind of choices are you gonna make? What's the pathfinder? Um, what do you have to integrate? What's going on here for you with this biceptile? Where, where are the opportunities and the gifts from the universe as well? What's the fate that you have to tune into and how do you make the right decision is second house, fifth house. And so dreaming, I think with Pluto coming to your Neptune and expressing yourself artistically, becoming very self-empowered with all that stuff in the second house, knowing you can make a living if you choose to, all right? Um, you have Sag on the cusp of your second house. So we would look at that and we would see that your Jupiter is retrograde in a new phase to Pluto at 29 Scorpio and it's opening up um, your Juno. Wait a minute, what's wrong with me here? Juno's in, why am I looking at Jupiter? Oh, because it rules your second house cusp. Okay, and then I'm sorry, I, I think I'm getting tired. Um, Saturn, which rules your Capricorn planets, is in Pisces in the fourth. And so it's opposite Chiron. So there's a lot of healing and learning for you about how do you fit in with the consensus and how do you heal the part of yourself that cares about the consensus orientation? And the VPP that's gonna get activated, I had a really strong feeling when I was looking at your chart that all of this is getting you ready for um, the Scorpio uh, will be the current pentagram and it'll be a retrograde one on your North Node. That's gotta be a big deal. And having one on your Venus, a gate on your Venus, has to be a really fortunate experience as well. Are you currently in love? Um, are you creatively expressing yourself? What's going on in your fifth house? It, only if you want to answer. For sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the, the really important thing about where I'm at right now is that I um, am coming out of a pretty long phase of being frankly, pretty depressed and, and really low energy, not able to do much. And I had a number of experiences happen, fairly traumatic, and it kind of drove me to really seek help. I didn't know what I needed. I just really knew something was wrong and I needed to, to seek that help out. And I was lucky to have the support of family and able, be able to do that because um, it involved me moving from where I grew up and stuff. So that was it was really important that I did that. And I'm at this point now where um, I feel very new. <laughs> I, you know, the, I guess a good, a nice way for me to look at it um, is that I now, you know, I want to say it's, it's really recent, maybe the past three to four months ish. Um, and of course it's always been like this process, but there's a real turning point around like, last December or so and I I'm just so I feel so much gratitude now you know I don't find myself that I, I mostly only ever find myself crying now uh, tears of joy which is just amazing to me because it was quite the opposite pretty much um, you know most of my young life so uh, well, I think that, I, yeah, you have a, a Mercury Pluto opposition and you have a Chiron Saturn. So wherever we find Chiron in a, a strong connection and Pluto, of course, is resonating that Mars Pluto, it's resonating that 20th degree right now for you. So there's just been tremendous healing going on, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's really, <laughs> it's pretty impossible to get it across to with words and just in a few minutes to someone like how profound everything kind of feels my life in general. I feel that fairly often and evolutionary astrologers know that when you have something in the same degree as Pluto, you have gone into the soul, the life of the soul, and you're either choosing to flow with it. And so you're becoming self-empowered or you're fighting it and you have crisis after crisis and trauma after trauma. And so we learn to align with our soul 
and we learn to share and we learn to care and we learn to include. And I add some other words, authenticity, integrity. We learn these things and we practice them and it, it is not a cakewalk. You know, you have to get up every day and go, sharing, caring, inclusion. And it becomes a way of life. And then you become, you, your Pluto Mars is right now giving you a lot of self-empowerment. And eventually, with your palace and your vest in the eighth house and your Mercury Pluto opposition, there's a possibility you can help other people learn to become self empowered. And that's the sharing, caring, inclusion of natural law and what we as evolutionary astrologers really want to help others learn to become self empowered. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that I feel like I finally have, uh, I've found at least, I mean, it'll be a process, but I've figured out how to value myself. You know, I, I knew that these parts of myself have always been there. I've just been fighting with them forever. So I've finally just something kind of clicked and, and things feel so much easier now. It's amazing <laughs> what kind of a shift that was. Um, I'm really excited to be able to serve now with the energy that I'm gaining back and give back to others because I've been taking a lot for myself recently. So, yeah. Okay, well, good luck. I'm glad Thank you're you. getting happier and happier. All right, okay. so here we have, um, I put down here, VPP1 is conjunct Wonder Woman. So that's your heiress, and I call heiress Wonder Woman. Sarah? <laughs> I, hi, I'm here. Are you feeling a bit like Wonder Woman, or is this coming in March? Because usually I find these things, you sort of get a sense of it already. Um, yes, kind of. Um, I'm, I, I definitely feel, um, like I'm just, it's almost like Jesus take the wheel and I'm on a mission and I'm not really thinking, I'm just acting. That's sort I of think, where I'm at right now. I think the VP, the, uh, the VPP, the current VPP is, let's see, what did I write here? Is that on your son, right? At 21 Capricorn, right? Mm -hmm. and, it's all, and Pluto's also there. So this has been a very self-empowering moment in your life from January. And of course it began earlier because Pluto was transiting that. And um, I, went, I, I go back to what Jeffrey said, you know, you only have so much time, Capricorn, and you have to really think about what are you gonna do with that time? What does your soul want to do? What does it want to wake up and how does it want to work and this bridge energy of the sixth house how do you want to learn to really integrate and live in the body so that you can figure out right work also capricorn um your mar your mars is on your south node in aquarius opposite your ascendant north node okay so see there's the seventh house Mars and it's opposite this. So you're going through these, this Leo uh, nodal transit anyway, but they're all skip steps to your Juno Lilith VPP3. And in October, that v, the new um, Venus pentagram point of the inferior uh, conjunction of the Sun and Venus is at three Scorpio. And so that's really, really important. And I think that the first gate on your Aries is the septile is, okay, what's the faded right way to figure out how you're going to choose what's of value because Mars is right on your Venus. This is all very complex for you. And um, Chiron at 13 could be an early kind of warning also uh, for you to figure out what to do all right because this one in aries is in the same degree and is that for your career is that what you're trying to learn for your career um well it's it's interesting because in recent months um i was working uh with very high um like premium level clients doing my work as a psychic and an astrologer and um, I had a major disillusionment in the very beginnings of the new year. And now I'm actually working um, at a nonprofit doing my work literally for whoever comes in and um, just trying to trust really that I have a place here to in something worth value to share with people through my, through my work. And um, I just feel like it's starting to come together. 
even though I'm not making nearly as much money as I was, I'm feeling more satisfaction and like I'm aligning with what I'm supposed to be doing through this work, which is what I like to call emancipation of the soul. <laughs> it might sound a little grandiose, but yeah. No, it sounds wonderful. Well, I think, you know, you can see how your Juno Lilith um, Uranus, you probably see a lot when you look at a chart, right? And you're psychic. And so I know how that is. I have all that too. And, you know, um, Pluto is sitting on your sun opposing your Lilith. This is not a casual time in your life. This is a very intense time of your, in your life. And I think that charity is something that we do as we evolve, you know, it, and, and Sarah, I'm having to go back out and do a bunch of charity work. I started some charity concerts for the homeless and I got so lucky. We got this huge band and now I'm doing more um, because people are asking me to it. So it's interesting that astrologers, <laughs> evolutionary astrologers are both have this and I have something where my ascendant is Pluto sitting there. So maybe, maybe Pluto is, um, I feel like it is. I think you can help the masses when you do, big charity work. Yes, and I wanted to mention another thing too. I'm also, um, yeah, charity work has been a major theme just starting this year. I'm also helping local indigenous communities with their work to protect the water and whatnot, just by showing up to help with physical work and making food and things like that. Good. Yeah, big change in my life, very much so, yeah. Well, that's Pluto on your, coming to your son in your sixth house, and the sixth house, I think is one of those houses of charity. Yes, yes. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, I, I think I, um, I'm glad that your Wonder Woman energy is working. I'm glad that Pluto's on your son and you're doing charity. Um, re, when you read slide nine, what Jeffrey said, just write that quote down somewhere, you know, just become, I think you're on the right track. You're really on the right track. You got a lot going on, a lot. Uh, yeah, it's pretty intense. I just have a real quick question just about the biceptile uh, Mars with my Venus. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, like, I honestly, I feel it's significant, but I'm not quite putting it together. Did you have any insight that you might be able to share about that for me? Um, yeah, it's on your Venus. So um, Mars on Venus is either a super creative connection with another human being or a super creative project comes out of yourself or a love affair or children. I mean, these are hmm. physical keywords. I have a lot of people that I do writing projects with and their Mars is always on my Venus and I have zero romantic or sexual connection to these people. It's very creative though, but our creativity is so in sync. And so I learned that that Mars Venus can be very a good creative connection. Um, I see. Yeah, I I just wanted to say I'm I've I'm tapping more into that as well, like uh, guitar lessons, writing more poetry. So that I just wanted to mention that as well. Well, I think you know your vertex is on the galactic center. I don't know if you work with the vertex. I know they don't, and it's one of the things in my toolbox that I love because it's true west. And so I've lived enough in the country and over an ocean where I've seen where the sun sets in the winter and where it sets in the center, uh, summer. And that's the vertex, the moving true west. And it's conjunct the galactic center and your Neptune. And, and your Venus is there in the new phase to all that stuff. So expressing yourself creatively, expressing yourself musically, um, contemplatively, meditatively, will really help you connect to the galactic center work. And for me, the galactic center work is where is humanity going and how does everything I do as a hundredth monkey help everybody else? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, pretty poignant. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So Linda, we are going to have this again after yes. the next gate. Yes. And so Tashi, um, would you like to just stop the share there? Yeah. Great. And you must be exhausted. So thank you so much for that. That was amazing. I loved it. Um, I'll just I'll put up the dates on the screen so that everyone can see them. And here they are. 
part two of Tashi's Venus Pentagram Mandala meeting, Zoom meeting, will be on May 24, 2018. The same volunteers will come back uh, where they'll be sharing, correlating and observing their experiences at gates one, two and three. So Tashi, how's that? That's great. That's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to, yeah. Um, I don't know if we can add, somebody didn't show up, so Lauren wants to try to join. We'll see. Um, it's up to Linda, really, and, and I, I mean, I'm all about sharing, caring, inclusion, so if I can, if you were here at the meeting and you want to get in on it, I'm happy to do it. Um, Lauren, it's fine with me. Yep, it's fine with me. Um, so Lauren will have to just backtrack a little bit and catch up, but I'm sure she can. Yeah, just fill out all the, fill out everything that you need to fill out. Yay. <laughs> she says yeah. thank you. Okay, good. Oh, good. Where, where do we get the information? Would Linda have it to give to me? Yes. Or? yes. Okay. Are, are, still, are we still recording or have we stopped recording? We're still recording. We're okay. still recording. All right. So I would like to thank you so much, Tashi, and everyone here would like to thank you. Would you all please thank Tashi Powers? Mm -hmm. And we'll see you again on May 24th for part two. Thank you so yeah. much, Tashi. That was amazing. Thank you, Tashi. You Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Tashi, you. Thank you. Really yeah. nice and very helpful for me to have you all as guinea pigs. Thank you. How wonderful. <laughs> I just love it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.